Okay. Uh, uh, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the uh, event. Uh, we are very happy that uh, Professor Chinmay Tumbe has uh, agreed to join us to talk about his uh, latest book, uh, The Age of the Pandemic. Uh, Chinmay has been, I guess, one of the most prolific uh, academics uh, in the recent times after graduating from I. He has had two books. Uh, me and Arnav are still trying to get our first book out. Uh, <laughs> India Moving, a book on migration, and now The Age of Pandemics, which he wrote during the lockdown. You know, So it's it's an amazing piece of work. And um, of course, uh, Chinma has given quite a few talks uh, uh, all over, but it was very important that Chinma comes back to his alma mater and give a talk here. So we are greatly uh, honored and indebted that Chinma has agreed to come and spend time with us. And uh, Arnab will be taking us through the session. Uh, over to you, Arnab. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, Chinmay, it's a pleasure to have you here with us. Um, uh, so, you know, uh, I was sort of, uh, I saw I saw your Facebook post uh, when you sort of released uh, this book. And I was like, wow, this is so timely. And so um, it's just uh, really lovely to sort of have you here. Uh, I've sort of finished reading it and I have to tell you that the least interesting page for me was the first page. And as, as I started going deeper in, it just sort of unfolded into so many different narratives, so many little uh, stories. And these stories connect in a very nice way. And I just picking up on Sridham's comment, it's just amazing to see you sort of put all of this in, in the kind of time span that you've done it in, including the working paper that you shared, which also has tidbits which are not there in the book. So I think in that sense, there is uh, there's the plethora of work that sort of this book represents. I think it's important that people should read this widely and uh, uh, discuss it widely. So what we have, uh, I think, uh, going into this uh, session is a plan in which uh, we'll sort of hand over to you, Chinmay, to sort of uh, talk a little bit about you know things that you uh, are uh, excited about as a part of the book and sort of share some of the insights that you see uh, perhaps both in the historical context as well as in the contemporary context. I have a couple of questions that I will subsequently sort of uh, pose to you, uh, which are specific to a couple of things and also ask you to speculate, which is uh, something I guess all armchair academics love doing. So I'll, I'll give you the mic to do a little bit of uh, you know speculation. And subsequently, I think um, we'll have uh, people in the audience come in and sort of ask questions. So, I mean, I'm, I'm thinking this is as a set of, you know, you go 20 minutes, we do 20 minutes together, and then the audience comes in for 20 minutes. And I mean, these 20 minutes are not, not you know, locked in stone. So, you know, uh, so yeah. Over okay. to you. Thank you so much for this very kind invitation. Uh, it's, a, it's always a pleasure and a privilege to be back at one's alma mater, uh, and especially one which you know, I've learned so much at, and all former professors uh, being out here. Uh, Arna, Professor Rupa Chandra, and uh, so many others. Uh, in fact, uh, my first book was on migration, and that was the, the starting point of that was the PhD thesis at IIM Bangalore. Uh, a large part of the chapter, second chapter of that book, you know, came from that. And interestingly, while my PhD thesis had nothing on pandemics, there was a particular chart of population growth rate between 1911 and 1921, which was actually from, which is there in my PhD thesis. Uh, and that was, in fact, one of the starting points for this you know, book project. Uh, and because I knew the word pandemic during my doctoral research, but I never really acted upon it. Uh, so while it took about 10 years to write the first book, uh, the second book happened in about 10 months uh, in a very sort of bizarre fashion. And the starting point was last March, literally to the day, you know, we are, we are on 12th March. This is when WHO announced this as a pandemic, 11th March last year. So we're exactly one year from when the WHO announced a pandemic. And the first reaction in India was very, quite interesting. Uh, one was a lot of people were in denial, saying nothing can happen to India. Uh, and a lot of the immunity argument that we're seeing today was you know, espoused then, uh, saying, you know, Indians. Uh, and then there's an additional argument saying Indians have never been, you know, uh, hit by pandemics. You know, so complete amnesia of past pandemics uh, to the extent where some people also said that pandemics have never originated in India. This is to be seen in this Chinese uh, you know, anti-China uh, sentiment, which was there at that time. And saying all pandemics have been started in China which is not the case and so on. And so that really prompted me to you know, uh, uh, pursue this matter in, in a, a bit. And then I realized that actually nobody's really written about this in a framework. And it turns out that India has been the epicenter of mortality in three large pandemics, the cholera pandemic, the plague pandemic, and the influenza pandemic uh, for about 100 years. And so that's what's 
you know, uh, has you know got me to this book, which I am now sharing on your screen. Uh, and this, the cover of the book shows you the reaction of uh, you know uh, the British authorities to plague. Uh, this is when plague arrived in Bombay. Uh, the British thought the best way to get rid of plague is to disinfect houses. Now it turns out that none of these measures actually work, which also tells you about this sense of you know confusion, which is which marks the onset of a pandemic. But this book is about a particular period of time, 1817 to 1920, which I argue is an age of pandemics, in the sense that no other century, barring arguably the 14th century, remember something called as Black Death in European history, or something called as the 6th century CE, apart from these two centuries, arguably there is no other century which registered so many deaths as a percentage of global population. I, my, the number I have is about 5%. 5% of global population in this time period dying due to pandemics. So it's a century of extraordinary high mortality, especially in India. Right? And so this is why uh, uh, this book has been written because uh, <clears throat> this, there's also a lot I, I believe one can learn from this particular period. So for example, just to give a flavor of some of the topics of why the history matters, uh, and this connects to a theme which I've worked on for a long time, which is migration. Last year, when we had the corona crisis, we had actually two crises. We got the corona crisis, but we also got a migration crisis. And we were witness to visuals like these of people, migrants, you know, walking back home and so on. And yet, while doing migration, historical migration research, I knew that certain things like this had happened in the past as well, in the sense that when pandemics or health crisis emerge, uh, a lot of migrants want to go back home. So this image that you see on the left is remarkably similar to the one you're seeing on the right. Right? Both of them show the same sense of anxiety. The one on the left shows you the exodus from Bombay City during the plague pandemic, which hit Bombay 18, late 1896. But this is an you know, illustration of you know, 6th February 1897. In both the images, you can sen see the sense of anxiety. You can see the little child on the mother's hand on this on the left-hand uh, side, and a very similar sort of image on the right. Sense of grief. And back then, it was heard on Victoria Terminus Station this you know, interesting line, ki agar marna hai, to gao mein marenge, right? And this is exactly what we heard last year. As well. So it's a remarkable set of you know, literally history repeating itself in terms of people wanting to go back home. And India's migration economy is so circular that people have one leg in the you know, village and one leg in the city. The difference, of course, between these two images is that one has the railways or the train and the other does not, right? And so what we saw last year is that uh, it's precisely because the railways were shut down uh, for a benevolent reason, saying we should not let the virus spread and so on, that these people had to walk back home. In this case, the British actually organized special trains, just like the government of India did last year, remember the Shramik trains. But the only difference is that this was planned out by the British in their intention that if they did shut down the railways, and this is all documented by the British, if they did shut down the railways, they feared that the people would anyway walk back home. So they kind of, for all their other faults, they kind of got this thing seemingly right. Uh, and last year, of course, we went for this lockdown, very strict lockdown, which then led to this two-month migration crisis. And of course, there will always be different views on what would, should have been the right approach and so on. But there's no doubt that this could have been handled much better. And I, I'll be happy to take do a Q&A on this. But this is, again, just to start this conversation, that there's a lot we can learn, actually, from these past episodes. I believe that we did not need to have this migration crisis if we actually studied past migration crisis uh, in uh, pandemic times. For example, the train was also shut down actually during in China during 1911, the plague outbreak in 1911 in China. And then also people walked back home. It was January 1911 and people died in the cold. So there was a humanitarian crisis in China when the railways was shut down for migrant workers during a pandemic. So you have different examples in history which kind of uh, uh, lay out this issue very closely. So this book has two main arguments. One is an argument in history and one is an argument for practice. The argument on history is that this particular period, 1817 to 1920, does not usually have pandemics in it. And that's because this history has been written pretty much in a Eurocentric fashion. And it is true that pandemics did not quite devastate Europe in, in a manner in which it did in the 14th century, what we call as the Black Death. Right? And so in their history writing of the world, pandemics never took hold. Instead, what we get is themes like nationalism, globalization, imperialism, or capitalism, right? And what I'm arguing is that a lot of these things are very intricately connected with pandemics, right? So for example, uh, take for example, 
even something like the WHO, last year the pandemic was declared by the WHO, the World Health Organization traces its roots to a conference in 1851, which was organized by some of these imperial powers to basically stop the outbreak of cholera, especially coming from Eastern India. Right? So even the intellectual history of the World Health Organization comes back to this age of pandemics. And then I argue that there's a value in remembering it on various counts to think of politics, to think of economics, a uh, variety of issues uh, from this particular. So to lay, lay the sort of macro overview, uh, these are numbers which I have collated across uh, you know, various geographies and time periods. And much of the statistical work of this book is not in the book. It's in a separate working paper. It's called Pandemics and Historical Mortality in India. It's an IMA working paper. So this forms the statistical appendix. So all the charts, tables, graphs, the occasional statistical regression is out here. Uh, I've not kept that in this book because the book is meant to be you know, uh, accessible to the general public. But the figures are very stark. In this period, more than 70 million people die across the world, of which 40 million are in India. You see plague, 12 out of 13 million in India. Influenza, what we sometimes call as the Spanish flu, 20 out of 40 million in India. And cholera is 8 out of 19. But when you add up the deaths of sort of uh, what is called as endemic cholera, that's about 30 million more. Okay, so these are large numbers. Uh, throughout this period, malaria was still the largest killer as a disease, but we rarely call malaria as a pandemic. Right? So pandemic is more of a disease which spreads across the world. So this idea of transmission and geographical spread, which is highly associated. And you'll see the terminal date is pretty much 1920. Now, it is not the case that it is exactly 1920. Right? So influenza, yes. But for plague, for example, it lingers on in the 1920s and then it fades. For cholera, similar. Right? So from 1920s, we're saying mortality starts falling. And it's not a coincidence that in India, the death rate of India starts falling from about 45 per thousand in 1920 towards lower and lower rates. And today it stands at about six or seven per thousand. Right? So 1920 is also a threshold here in India's demographic history because it's from that time that India's life expectancy, which at that time was shockingly low in the range of 20 to 25 years, it starts increasing. And today our life expectancy rate is about 70 years. So this is a remarkable century, which preceded a century of tremendous progress. And it all starts with 1817, where the cholera outbreak you know, uh, starts from Eastern India, close to Jessore. Uh, now, why does it start? Cholera has been there with you know, humanity for a long time. It turns out that this particular strain of cholera seems to be unusually virulent. A lot of theory as to why. Uh, but what we do know is from Jessore, it reaches Calcutta in August 1817. You'll see the dates out here. And by you know, January 1819, which means it takes about one and a half years for it to reach from Eastern India to Southern India. Right? And so this kind of tells you the amount of time it took in the early 19th century. It would take years for a pandemic to actually occur. Unlike COVID today, which is you know, real time, within a few weeks, the whole world got it. This was a time period where you did not have the railways. You did not really even have steamboats. It took a lot of time for its transmission. A lot of theories on transmission, and I'll come to that uh, in a little bit. But this gives you a sense of how the pandemic uh, uh, was seen. It is also not seen, remember, there's no telegraph in this time. It was not a real, you did not really have real time news. You did not have a COVID type, you know, cholera dashboard. All this has to wait for the late 19th century. And what was cholera? Cholera was a disease which basically ripped apart your stomach in the sense that you would have to go to the toilet, you'd have passed a lot of loose motions, uh, but death would be quite instantaneous. It was a disease, a uh, bacteria based disease. Uh, which was not known in 1817, which basically led to a lot of dehydration. That was a fundamental aspect of cholera. And so this is an image which would show you, you know, what would happen to the person. Often the face would turn blue, sunken eyes. These are the classic symptoms. And its eventual uh, way to treat cholera came about only in the late 20th century. So we're saying 1950s onwards. So for about 120 or 30 years, there was really no effective cure against cholera. And the final cure that came was oral rehydration therapy, which many people say is the greatest invention by the medical field and so on, because very cost effective. And it's cut down case fatality rates. In the 19th century, case fatality rates were more than 50% for cholera, so very high. And it gradually you know, came down over time, but it's now today negligible. So today, cholera is no longer dangerous. When it first came, it spread from India to Europe by the 1830s and then across the world. By the late 19th century, you have cholera so much in South America that you, know, you have a novel, famous novel by Gabriel Marquez called Love in the Time of Cholera, which tells you how much cholera from Eastern India has kind of settled across the world. 
And this is an example from 1830s where cholera, there's so many advices on cholera, like any disease, you know, different advices. This is basically a cartoon showing you, you know, that no, nothing seemed to work against cholera. And so it's like, you know, uh, an uh, overabundance of useless advice concerning protection against cholera. This is a cartoon showing when cholera came to the US, this is in 1866. Cholera devastated much of America in 1832, 1849, and 1866. And remember, it was called Indian cholera. Just like the Americans are calling this as the Chinese virus, it was known as the Indian cholera. And Indians were blamed for it. For about 100 years, India was seen as the starting point of the cholera pandemic. Right? And India would be blamed by people around the world for this, and within India, certain you know, uh, sectors. Uh, so this is an example to show the economic impact. People would leave cities and hence you know, uh, rent, rents would fall in cities. And so this is a cartoon which says, uh, I, you'll have to come down with your rents. I intend to occupy these premises myself. You know, an, an example of the disease and the economic sort of impact. Uh, the impact on Egypt was severe. Uh, in my book, I gave, you know, a, a, a cross country sort of uh, distribution of mortality. And Egypt arguably lost the most number of people as a percentage of its population. So it was very, very harsh in Egypt. Uh, and this is, a, this is kind of a still Egypt, from Egypt in the late 19th century, again, showing kind of the devastation. An example of quarantine, you can see the kind of social distancing involved out here. Uh, nobody really knew what was happening with cholera. This is a, a set in Russia. Russia was another country hugely affected by cholera. Uh, famously, Tchaikovsky, the famous composer, died of cholera. Uh, let's say an example of quarantine. So quarantines, which were there before the 19th century as well, came into huge prominence in the 19th century to defeat cholera. Now, how did cholera transmit itself? Uh, we know today that cholera is mostly a waterborne disease. And many of you might have heard of John Snow and his famous cholera map based in London, which kind of deciphered. It was a nice classic experiment, which said it is basically contaminated water, which leads to cholera. So cholera, we say, is a disease which has fecal oral transmission. So if your discharges get, get mixed up with the drinking water sources and you ingest it, then that's how you get cholera. Now, the British scientist, uh, John Snow, figured this out in 1850s. The British and Europe and Western Europe and US invested then in basically good pipe water systems in the late 19th century, but this did not happen in India. Remarkably, the, the officials, the medical officials, resisted this new scientific paradigm because the reigning theory of every disease transmission back then was air, or this idea of miasma. And so Indian medical officers steeped in this particular older scientific paradigm refused to believe the waterborne transmission and refused to introduce modern methods of con controlling cholera. And so this is an example of a particular map shown by M.C. Fernal, 1887, who's showing you actually a, a very interesting you know, depiction. He's showing you a caste level map. This is a, a map of, two, of a particular village in South India, where on one side, a particular caste group resides, on the other side, another caste. And this point A and B on this map are the wells. And it so happened that that's the major water source. And because of this strict caste-based segregation, uh, the, the two sort of sides of the streets are not really uh, intermingling or drinking each other's water sources. And it so turns out that in this particular village, it's the high ranking castes who have more cholera incidents because their water sources are contaminated. And MC Fernal used this map to argue that, look, cholera is waterborne and what John Snow is for saying is right. So it's not the case that, you know, when, when they understood how cholera was happening, there was wide scientific disagreement on this. And in India, it had to wait for another 40 years before the actual practices started. In some cities like Calcutta, they did introduce pipe water and that did, did apparently uh, reduce cholera incidence rates. But I'm just trying to point this out that across the 19th century, there were such stark views on disease transmission that even within the European fraternity, there was no consensus. And this had to wait the so-called bacterial uh, sort of bacteri bacteriological revolution to kind of understand really how diseases work and so forth. Uh, cholera also sort of inspires as first attempts at vaccination. This is a famous photograph of Valdemar Hafkin, after whom the Hafkin Institute in Bombay is named. And some of the first pioneering uh, vaccine development in India happened for cholera. Hafkin came to India to test his cholera vaccine. He then stayed back another 20 years, you know, interesting life. A lot of, he was, he was sort of uh, convicted of a crime of vaccination malpractice, but then his name was cleared of that. He's a kind of hero today in the scientific world. He worked on cholera, plague, and many other things, and most famously set up this lab in Bombay, which became a leading center of vaccine development in the 20th century. In fact, if you got a vaccine shot, which was made by Serum Institute, uh, it's an interesting story of how that's related to Hafkin. 
uh, the other punawala you know, belongs to this punawala family and they were horse breeders they had nothing to do with vaccines but they would provide ingredients to the hafkin institute right and so it's a very interesting link of with the vaccine shot that you're going to take today in a way is directly linked to this photograph that you're seeing here because it's thanks to hafkin that the hafkin institute was set up uh, then called the then called the bombay bacteriology lab uh, and it's thanks to the hafkin institute that you got the serum institute uh, uh, today so there's a clear link between today's vaccination efforts and the vaccination efforts of the age of pandemics now how effective were these vaccines we can't really say the the doctors that at that time said more than 50% which is not numbers which we would go with today right but it was something to work on because it was so devastating uh, they also thought that you know cholera was uh, uh, because of pilgrimages pilgrims were highly sort of uh, were seen as uh, the, the carriers of this so there's a lot of attempts to target pilgrims in this particular cholera was finally won by multiple methods first john snow showed that it is waterborne then robert cock discovered the bacteria leonard rogers who was part of the indian medical service basically showed that if you only if the problem of cholera was dehydration what you should do is rehydrate and so he invented this iv method uh, intravenous treatment methods which cut down case fatality rates from 50% to 20% and all of this was based in calcutta and then famously sambuna day an indian scientist actually who many people don't really know much about solved the real mystery of how cholera acts upon our bodies in the 1950s many people say you know he should have won the nobel prize for that but by that time cholera had dimmed in importance and so that is why his discovery did not uh, make uh, you know much of a wave uh, but after that you know ort oral rehydration therapy was based on that and so today we say cholera is the pandemic has ended because we know how to deal with cholera even if you get cholera the case fatality rates are negligible right? so it's a pandemic which has ended both on the side of prevention because of better water treatment systems and the side of cure now i'll talk about plague very briefly plague was very harsh plague has been there throughout history it's been there in indian history for a long time it was in ahmedabad city in the early 19th century but when it came from arguably china in the late 19th century it caused a lot of panic because the british had plague in their memory london was devastated by the plague in 1660s so they wanted to control plague at any cost and so bombay became the expert laboratory where they implemented the harshest surveillance measures possible and those measures by the way are still in place today you will know that covid uh, curtailment measures today fall under this epidemic disease act of 1897 and this is because this act was passed to curtail the plague of those times so again a link between today's pandemic and the past and when the pandemic came a classic response was to pray right so because uh, a classic response across societies in the world was to uh, uh, take recourse in superstitions and religions and so on. so this is an example of people praying so that the plague goes an example of the really harsh surveillance measures again we saw some of these photographs last year when migrants when they went back home they were literally you know uh, washed clean you remember some of those visual disturbing visuals that came last year this is an example of a person disinfecting you know uh, patients during the outbreak of bubonic plague now plague basically had you got these big boils bubonic plague was very uh, dangerous and the transmission mechanism basically worked through rats and rat fleas but this was not known for a long time this is a, a photograph from the temporary hospital set up in bombay a uh, plague hit certain parts of india and for a long time it was a big mystery and this is again you know you can see today where the one of the big mysteries of covid 19 is why it affects some parts of the world why it affects some parts of india not others and everyone has their pet hypothesis just to give you an example of you know how one should be very careful about this a uh, plague eventually hit these kind of, these parts of india much more you know, the shaded regions and if you see the time series of plague mortality it rarely ever hit madras presidency in south india it rarely ever hit eastern india and in the initial years the officials at say madras calcutta cities prided themselves for controlling plague very similar to what we see in india today saying we have managed to control the pandemic now it later turned out that when the transmission was finally figured out people realized that actually plague depended on a particular ecology of rats and rat fleas and that was simply not possible to happen in south india and east india so there was a particular disease ecology which favored the transmission of plague and it was not so much pandemic management rather than sort of this non you know management related factor that drove the regional variations and so the period between 1897 and 1905 was this interesting period where people had all sorts of theories of why plague happened but once transmission was figured out they understood what to do they had to have better rat proofing of houses and so on and all the previous measures sort of went to it in a way we are kind of in a similar zone we know some aspects of covid 19 but there's still so much that we don't know 
that in future years we we might actually look back in the times we're living in right now saying this is a much better or much more elegant theory to explain regional variation uh, an example of a vaccination certificate i thought i'd show this because all of us are getting now these vaccination jabs and these certificates uh, and some of these you know lines are very similar from the early certificates uh, the difference of course is that today's certificate also has the photograph of the prime minister this was not there uh, back then a uh, plague was won eventually through a variety of means but interestingly plague disappeared from the indian subcontinent the most accepted theory is not so much from active sort of uh, prevention or cure but herd immunity right? so it's a pandemic which goes out by herd immunity but not herd immunity of human beings but herd immunity of rodents right so it's as if the if the rats were immune to plague then they would not fall and if the rats did not fall the fleas wouldn't have any reason to bite human beings right so it's an interesting argument that there's a particular uh, ecosystem in which plague thrives and that's what changed later on we got antibiotics we got ddt and a variety of ways some important people uh, Sh you know shiva suburu and yersin discovered the bacteria liston who was born in india part of the indian medical service understood this transmission of rats rat plague right so major discoveries and i put the picture samthri by phule because women were actually at the forefront of a lot of civil society actions against pandemics and i've written a fair amount on this but uh, samthri by phule in particular died of the plague uh, and she died after starting a clinic for plague victims right so very a critical part of the initial fight against plague. the bulk of the plague actually happened not in 1890s but between 1900 and 1910 finally influenza this is a pandemic which devastated the world this is an article from the times of india of march 6 1919 with this headline called 6 million deaths until this particular day nobody really knew how many people were dying right and influenza if you've been following it it came in two waves the devastating wave was you know september october november uh, 19 uh, 18 uh, and uh, my research shows that the unusually large number in india uh, was uh, arguably not just just because of the the uh, virus but also because of certain other factors but i'm putting it out here because the 6 million deaths quickly became the figure for people to go with but new estimates show that it was not 6 million it is much more than 6 million because what happens in a pandemic with mass mortality is that the death statistic collection system also collapses right and so in the influenza you have horrendous cases of bodies being dumped into the ganges river in north india you know it is a horrific sort of time to live in i argue in the book that it had many implications the rise of gandhi for instance the rise of the india's labor movement so so many people died it tilted the balance of power towards labor in the next decade and so on uh this is a chart on you know influenza uh, it's a chart on population growth rates at the district level in the district boundaries of today so this is data for 1911 to 1921 but this is not obviously geographical boundaries of those times and you should of particular interest is the red shaded stuff at the bottom of the screen uh, because this is a chart actually from an iim bangalore phd thesis you know when i was doing this about a decade ago uh and when i was doing this i was trying to make an argument on migration so i gave a series of maps on this but at the bottom of this i said this was because of influenza and so i revisited this map and i've now kind of trying to analyzing you know why did influenza hit certain parts more than others and it turns out that 1918 was also coincide it coincided that year with one of india's worst droughts in recorded history so it was not just influenza influenza came on the back of mass misery caused by a drought the monsoon had failed and in particular food prices were surging and in eastern and southern india actually food prices were either flat or you know in fact in south india also falling and i am arguing that in these places you did not see so much mortality while case incidence ratios were broadly same the mortality was excessive in western and northern india right and i show this kind of a correlation between drought intensity and influenza mortality so the argument being that influenza worked on existing malnutrition the malnutrition coming from a price rise or inflation due to a drought so a particular set of circumstances which have seems to have driven excess mortality in india i'm going to end now by just showing you this one image of you know instructions influenza remember was a virus but people really did not know what hit them in 1918 until you know 80 years later people reconstructed this virus only about 80 years later uh, and the influenza pandemic is a classic example of herd immunity in the sense it came and went arguably because you know so many people were infected the estimates my estimates for india is about 40 to 60% of the population of india got the flu okay of which about 10% died so case fatality rate of 10% which means about 6% of india's population perished 
Okay, so that's that. Those are the kind of numbers. To give you some sense of perspective, two hundred thousand people were dying every single day in November nineteen eighteen. Today, our overall COVID nineteen mortality, for all its reporting errors, is at is at about one fifty thousand. Right, so that's the scale of mortality which was happening there. And of course, if you see this, you know, you'll see the mask. You'll see a lot of interesting uh, directions. This is, of course, based in the U.S., but similar things were documented for India. So I'll end now and be open to you know the conversation. This was just to give you a flavor of the book. It's about three different pandemics. They have very interesting similarities, and I do think there's a lot to learn. Uh, history often does not repeat itself exactly, but we say history often rhymes. Uh, this is a book which is now, of course, in the IM library. Uh, but I thought I'd just end by pointing out that the book is dedicated to a good friend of mine who was uh, our librarian. Uh, who unfortunately, you know, whose life was taken away by this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, and so I thought I'd just end by pointing out uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic is very real and, you know, has, has affected us all in a very painful way. But on a per capita kind of basis, the age of pandemics was unusually large. Uh, and to put it in some perspective, COVID-19 is really a tiny fraction of the kind of mortality seen back then. All right, so I'll stop now. I'll be happy to take this conversation forward. You're mute. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Chinmay. That's a really nice summary. I had a bunch of questions which I think would be now transparently addressed to sort of uh, everyone who's sort of listening in. Uh, what uh, I'd like to do a little bit is, you know, um, uh, we haven't had a pandemic quite like this since 1919, right? So yeah. uh, if you look across the world, I mean, there's been a consistent rise in uh, uh, you know, uh, life expectancy. Uh, and I, the first time we have ever heard of a decline in life expectancy actually is with COVID. I mean, the estimate is that uh, the US life expectancy has gone down. But in some sense, um, one of the things that struck me is that apart from the academics of like infectious disease studies, the administrative structure of also managing infectious diseases and diseases in general uh, in India happened to be on the back of this uh, administrative service, the Indian Medical Service. Uh, I was wondering if you would uh, expand on that a little bit. Uh, I think th 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 there are quite a few A, scientific, B, uh, policy relevant things uh, yeah. that, uh, that got, got done in India and in partnership with a lot of the intellectual sort of scientific uh, debates. I think that is something that's quite interesting to see that uh, you know India was right up up there in terms of solving these issues. Absolutely. I mean, the Indian Medical Service, not our numbers point, the IMS, uh, was a, a highly sought after job for some of the cutting edge work. This, so we're talking about late 19th century, really, out here, uh, and early 20th century. So time roughly from 1860 to you know, 1920s or so. Uh, and a lot of the people who wanted to, because this is a time when the, the, great, the great ones, you know, people like Louis Pasteur, Robert Koch, these are the guys who are you know, really discovering cutting edge stuff. And suddenly there's this belief that we can actually control diseases, you know, wipe them out completely. So this is a base, massive mindset shift that's happening by the late 19th century. And so it's in that kind of milieu in which you have people like, you know, Hafkin coming to India. But the Indian Medical Service is a bureaucracy. It's a, it's a bureaucratic organization which has people trained in science and medicine, but they're trained in certain paradigms. Right? And so what's interesting is that there's so many different paradigms. Today, you know, we're pretty much accepting this whole idea of bacteria, viruses, at that time, people were, you know, there's a, there's a quip I give in the book, like Florence Nightingale, you know, who's this famous first health worker of the 19th century. She refused to believe in this germ theory. She refused to believe in bacteria. And somebody gave her a microscope and said, look, look, this is what it is. And that's when she said, okay, she conceded, you know, in 1890s and so on. Uh, so you have very interesting, I mentioned this guy called Petten Koffer, who's a German sanita sanitation official, credited with, you know, reforming sanitation systems in Germany. He maintained that cholera is airborne, it is not waterborne, and he had his adherents, including in Britain and including the Indian Medical Service. And so for on cholera, actually, the Indian Medical Service, while they collaborated, they did a lot of things, they got the basic premise spectacularly wrong. Right? And so for about 30, 40 years, they were well behind the curve. I mentioned two uh, commissioners of the Indian Medical Service, Cunningham, both the name Cunningham, who steadfastly refused to invest in this idea of the waterborne transmission. Right? So that's one story that different paradigms and people didn't know what to really do. But by the 1890s and 1910s, the 1900s, there's a clear sea change within the Indian medical service. And people realize that we can actually now curtail disease and we have to be receptive to you know, better knowledge and so on. 
So one example is the journal, like Indian Medical Gazette becomes, you know, it's like in a, we, we all talk about journals in the, you know, in the research world. The Indian Medical Gazette has published some phenomenal articles which have changed, you know, humanity. For example, this, this paper I quote, you know, plague, rats, and fleas. In fact, I, I think it should be taught in all, you know, research methods courses. It's a six-page paper with no tables, very elegant by Glenn Liston, who's born in Sikandrabad. Basically points out that plague is likely to be transferred through rats to humans via rat feeds. It seems obvious today. It was not so before that paper came out in the Indian Medical Gazette. So there was suddenly a complete transformation of people's sort of aspirations. We don't, we don't know too much about Indian scientists. A lot of them are born in India, but British. Indian scientists really come into the story from about 1920s onwards. You know. But I would say two famous scientists, I would say three important people of this, you know, who have really changed the world. One was Ronald Ross, who was you know, born in Almora, again, in India, uh, and uh, got the Nobel Prize in 1901 or two. And he you know, confirmed this mosquito malaria link. There's one argument, if you read Amitabh Ghosh's Calcutta chromosome, you know, he plays it around Ronald Ross and native knowledge, saying you know, the natives always knew this. It's just that Ronald Ross kind of systematically pro proved this. Either way, it became a big deal. And because of that discovery, we now know how to deal with malaria to a certain extent. So that was a major discovery. Uh, then you have uh, Glenn Liston, was born in Sikandrabad, who you know, changes. Remember, plague has been there with us for it, maybe thousands of years. You know, and it has really changed civilizations. If you see the literature on Black Death, how it transformed Europe, you know, it by some accounts abolished feudalism, you know, variety of things that happened through that. Nobody knew what was hitting them. You know, for it was such a mystery for many, many centuries. Uh, and the standard operating procedure then was evacuate. Nobody knew anything better than uh, better than that. Uh, and Glenn Liston is a guy who goes against the stated knowledge. The Indian Plague Commission in the initial years actually says it cannot be through the rat flea mechanism. Right? And he goes against it. He says, there's some interesting ideas. Let me test it. And he you know, finally makes his break. And the third guy of interest from the Indian Medical Service is this Leonard Rogers. Uh, and I showed some of the maps from his. And he's the guy, again, he's less of a scientist, more of a physician. And he's uh, basically obsessed with reducing case fatality rates of cholera. And he's the guy who gets this IV treatment. And his, the techniques he uses, the hypertonic you know, solutions used in that IV treatment, are truly revolutionary. He cuts down the case fatality from over 50% to close to 10%. And all of this is happening in a college in Calcutta. So it's amazing how India is a site. Robert Koch himself does a lot of these things in India. Uh, the, this, uh, some of the famous vaccination you know, attempts were also tried out in it. So India is actually a major site for some of the leading scientific you know, discoveries and breakthroughs that happened in this particular period. Uh, and by the and you can see the spillover of that with the guy like Sambhuna Day. You know, so 1950s, Samuna Day has seen these guys as seniors, and he's now at the cutting edge of the front, and he's kind of discovering things. So there's a very both mixed. There's one legacy is the bad legacy of dissing the science, but then there's a quick turnaround. And by the early 1900s, you know, there's a lot of respect for what the Indian Medical Service has to say. So uh, uh, thanks, uh, uh, I think that's sort of of, uh, really sort of uh, uh, gives a summary of you know uh, some of these really really interesting things which I think the modern conversation uh, uh, completely misses uh, yeah. I mean one of the sort of comments uh, that sort of I'm getting uh, is from uh, I don't know if you overlapped with uh, Anish Menon when he was a student uh, in the FPM program here at I am Bangalore but um, so he's he's sort of uh, logged in and he's uh, curious about, uh, you know, generally one says mm. that pandemics lead to a decline in inequality. However, we don't see that with COVID. Yeah. Uh, do you have anything to sort of uh, explain why that might be? Uh, I mean, uh, I think there are two big statements. One is, you know, pandemics reduce inequality in general. Uh, yeah. I think that's coming, see, the way, for example, I argue that the labor movement in India really picked off you know, because of this. So one way to see COVID as against the age of pandemics is that this is a pandemic which has had a disproportionately larger impact on economies than demographies, right? So that's one way to see the class difference. Because as I said, you know, you work out the percentage of mortality, it's a really tiny number. It's unfortunate, but it's a very, really tiny number as against 6% of the population. Time. So to have this inequality reducing or let's say bargaining power of labor to go up, you need to have that scale of black death or influenza kind of mortality. So this is a pandemic with, in relative historical terms, very little mortality. But I would say the economic impact has been huge. Right? In fact, the economic impact has been much more. And in the economic impact, we know the inequality. Right? Those who can work from home, people like you and me, basically have done very well. 
and people who can't work from home, which is the bulk of the workforce, have done really, really bad. So in a sense, the lack of mass mortality from what we've seen. So to make the first statement that pandemics reduce inequality, the examples people gave are stuff like influenza, stuff like uh, you know black death, but that's not comparable in terms of mortality. They might still be comparable in terms of economic impact. You know, I, I point out in India's economic history from 1900 to 2020, the two worst years of GDP contraction was 1918 and 2020, both pandemic years. In both cases, in 1918, the economy tanked about 10%. Uh, this is Siva Subramanian numbers. And uh, to 2020, it's about 8%. Right? So both times, but that time, 6% of the population was also wiped out. This time, you know, it's a 0. 0.0000 or some percent of population which has been wiped out. So that's the basic difference, I think. Uh, but the inequality can also happen at multiple levels. So for example, sex selectivity of mortality. That is another way in which you know, pandemics can affect inequality. I don't know the exact literature. From what I hear, COVID-19 is more uh, harsh on men than women based on you know, the, the emerging literature. But plague, for example, hit women much more than men. Right? And so that was one of the kind of thing on the gender inequality side. So I think that's broadly how I would see the, the demographic shock has to be substantial to kind of have an inequality changing effect. Uh, okay, so uh, a completely different sort of uh, question also from Anish, uh, which is, uh, why do you think the British adopted the right method to control cholera in England and um, the wrong one in India? Um, uh, so <laughs> getting yeah. into the politics of things. No, that's a great question. Uh, see, what is happening in this, again, a context of the late 19th century, they did not fully bind the waterborne theory, but they fully bought in the idea that we should have clean water. And there are two things, because cholera is one aspect of this whole clean water debate. But there were other factors saying that they could see that the quality of the Thames in London, for example, was not quite clear. Right? And so there was a larger you know, uh, 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 system. Uh, let, let me say this way. Cholera was one of the factors, but not the only factor due to which Western Europe and North America invested heavily in transforming water systems of their, especially urban water systems. But the fact is that the fact that they transformed urban water systems immediately cut down cholera mortality. Right? And that is why we say cholera mortality rates were falling in the late 19th century in, this, in the Western world, whereas actually they were increasing in India at the same time. And in India, that, those debates, for some reason, never took place. One can either argue that the British were not you know, interested enough. One can point out that the British actually did not have much money. You know, they, the fiscal resources of the British were very weak. One of the things I point out in the book is uh, also the comparison of the British with the princely states, right? And so some of the princely states seem to be fairly progressive. For example, Travancore. So when you see the thing of Kerala's public health system, you know, Travancore was also fairly ahead of the curve. Travancore actually reached out to this guy called MC Fernal, who was proposing this waterborne theory. Right? And he said, please come and give a presentation to us. You know, we are, we are interested in what, you're, what you have to say about Kerala. But on, on the average, you know, you find that many of these princely states were about as clueless uh, as the British were. And as I pointed in the book, influenza mortality was very large in Nizam rule Hyderabad and the Rajputana or the princely rule states of Rajasthan as well. So this thing about whether British rule places were more hit than Indian states and so on, it's it's mixed. It's all you know uh, mixed. But there's no doubt that the British did some things really wrong during influenza, for instance. You know they they they've diverted food grain for the war effort, World War One effort, and so there's a lot of uh, uh, starvation kind of incidents in India. Uh, so. To answer your question, I think the context of investing in water treatment systems was very different. It was beyond cholera. Uh, and in India, those pressures didn't seem to be there in, in the late 19th century. Uh, let me ask you uh, one more question uh, from, from the uh, audience. This is coming from Professor Abhay Oja. And he's asking, your uh, presentation suggests that prevailing wisdom or paradigm uh, was not good at dealing with the pandemic. Uh, a new one uh, was required. So in this, in this context, uh, should we trust the current science with COVID-19? Uh, uh, there have been pauses in vaccination rates yeah. in some countries. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, firstly, you know, I, I'll start with the caveat. I'm not a scientist. So, you know, I've, I've looked at history and particular events as I make it very clear in the book. I don't know much about the, the science of each and every disease uh, on, on this uh, subject. But uh, so let I'll, I'll 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 answer this you know based on what I what, what I see in history, uh, there is uh, incremental knowledge. Right? So the Plague Commission of India, 
they got many things wrong between 1896 well 1897 to about 1902 they had these it was very good that they did those reports they were using the prevailing wisdom of those times and they documented everything and people like glen liston was still surprised as to why they they were trying to see okay this is the stated theory but this is not fitting the facts and so let's invest more in this i would say those play commission reports though today we can say they were scientifically wrong still had value in pushing these guys to kind of you know see the gaps and in discovering those gaps they basically you know did well so for example this whole thing about rats and rat fleas the play commission dissed the idea they said this thing doesn't make sense because they said that there were fleas in the hospitals and doctors were not contracting fleas right so this was the argumentation saying the fleas argument doesn't work and glen liston said this was a good idea that play commission had but he was really obsessed with the idea that the flea must be doing something because what they found was that often around this place where the bubo would develop they would find that you would find flea bites so there's some connection between flea this is what liston thought and then he later found out that it's the particular kind of flea which matters and those fleas were actually not in the hospitals so the original premise of the british that there were fleas in the hospital but doctors did not get flea was actually right but liston used that to actually find out what kind of fleas matter so i think once you're not i think probably you know completely this you know every all the science that is saying it's incremental knowledge i think some of the things might be shown to be wrong later on i think there was a huge stuff on surface transmission of covid-19 today we are not really talking so much about surface transmission right but on masks i think there's a broad consensus that masks there are a lot of studies now which shows the efficacy of masks in relative terms i don't think 6 years down the line we'll say masks were completely un, 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 you know not required and so on Uh, but on surface transmission you know how much precaution many of us started taking uh, last year uh, maybe that was you know over the board at that point but that's how i think science works it's important i think some of the great thing that's happened is the fact that within a year you know this vaccination thing has uh, happened your point on some countries stopping vaccination i think again a lot of that is about you know about trials about how 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 comfortable are you with uh, efficacy you know uh, the kind of uh, success ratios of these uh, vaccination so to put it in short i would still trust science over not doing anything right so i think there's a huge value in science and when you see these pandemics yes they have been we don't really care about plague and cholera today precisely because science over the time has you know uh, uh, done well to curtail these diseases plague still is uh, there in madagascar apparently so uh, there's one part of the world which still gets affected by plague every year uh, for some that's a, that's a mystery for the medical world about how they've not been able to stop plague in madagascar uh but uh, apart from that it it seems to be uh, you know well controlled across uh, the world uh so yeah that's i think that's you know broadly how i would see that so uh, uh, now uh, i think can i uh, wait uh, the sound seems to be echoing um yeah so it seems to have stabilized so um one of the things that i was completely unprepared for was uh, sort of your comments around the uh, uh you know gangadhar tilak and uh vallabhai patel sort of uh, starting their political careers in sort of uh, trying to manage pandemics um in in this sense uh this is a very very sort of uh, interesting phase i mean i think uh, would would you say that this shaped their view of how to engage with people because you know in some sense pandemics are very apolitical i mean they will hit you if you are exposed so you know caste etc etc uh yeah so i think i think you know uh, there's no doubt that the political careers of many of our stalwarts in the freedom movement uh, did start in this whole context of the pandemic right? and uh, it's amazing many of them who were directly part of it patel for example you know they have written up also about it they've commented on it uh, so so this i mean let, let me say at the broader level uh, not just the you know freedom struggle the thing that really mattered in the early 20th century the first two decades was the cooperative movement Right. So India's cooperative movement. Many of the first generation leaders of India's cooperative cooperatives, you know, like Amul and so on. The cooperative movement leaders actually were people who were working plague duty. Because remember, for about a decade, the standard operating procedure for plague was to evacuate. Which means, if you're a village, when plague arrives, plague was seasonal. Plague arrives, you basically evacuate the village during the night time. So you camp outside the village and you come back during the day. Now this was traditional knowledge. Nobody knew why this was happening. It later turned out that these rat fleas operate well at night. they are sensitive to light and so on so there was some scientific you know uh, wisdom in that traditional knowledge now when uh, uh, these people had to go out you needed new capabilities so organizational capabilities to basically organize the villages to evacuate out so not just villages but towns so an entire cadre of people of 
kind of community level leaders emerged during the plague pandemic. Okay, so that's definitely you know one thing which was there, uh, and that's it's in that context which Servants of India Society you know, really came about in a big way, uh, associated with Gokhale and so on. So in Western India in particular, I also pointed out Lala Ajpatra in Punjab and so on. But definitely for Patel, Patel was uh, the his first major job was the as a member of the sanitation committee of Ahmedabad municipality. You know, and uh, in 1917 plague broke out, and this was a, a major thing for uh, uh, Patel. So. For, for Tilak, you know, he was sent to jail during the plague year uh, for criticizing the government's policy, and he co comes back as a national hero. Uh, Gokhale was the, they became the municipality uh, head of Pune uh, during the plague uh, context. So this is an important period, uh, you know, between especially 1890s to 1920, which really shapes a lot of uh, our, our political struggle. And, you know, I know when, I, when I was writing this, I realized how many of our key markers of our freedom movement can be actually bookended by pandemics. Look at 1857, you know, 1857, I never knew before, you know, doing research for this book, that in the months leading up to 1857, uh, there was a major cholera outbreak. Uh, and there's actually a paper in a management journal, I think Administrative Science Quarterly, one of these things. There's a paper out there which I cite, garrison towns which had more exposure to cholera outbreaks saw more mutinies. Right? So in a sense, and so the theory of this paper is that, you know, it kind of heightened the prejudice against uh, the, the rulers, and that's why you saw more revolts in those times. So 1857 uprising, major event of political history. You know, you had the cholera pandemic. And then you have the rise of people like Patel, you know, uh, Gokhale, uh, Cong Congress. Actually, the Congress split also. In 1907, the Congress split happens in the year of the plague. One million deaths due to plague in 1907, and that's the year of the Congress split. Uh, so some reviewer of my book, by the way, said, uh, will we see a Congress split in, the, in this year of the pandemic? Uh, Cheesy Lee kind of uh, took that one part of the book uh, for, for uh, uh, comparison. Uh, if you ask me, like, what will the current COVID thing, you know, lead to a new uh, crop of uh, political leaders? I can think of one person, you know, Sonu So If Sonu Sud gets into politics, uh, uh, even ten years down the line, we will say that you know he, his career was defined by the by the pandemic, and they're huge. I know they're huge pressures by, from different political parties to try and get it because he became like a savior for those migrant workers. Uh, so that so and what was he doing? He was trying to organize. So that's the thing. I mean, people who are trying to organize, civil society really steps up, as we saw last year, because typically the, the state kind of doesn't have so much capacity, whether back then or now. And so civil society picks up, and many of them then might go into politics. So we won't see the immediate political forward, but maybe 10 or 20 years later, we'll find some leaders who say, my first foray into you know, public life was during 2020. Uh, 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 thanks, uh, uh, Chinmay. So uh, one, I think, uh, other question that sort of comes in, which is, um, you know, you mentioned this, the Epidemic Act of uh, 19, uh, 1897, which is sort of the point of legal continuity between, uh, you know, uh, uh, the plague, influenza, and COVID. Uh, it seems to be a very strange law, right? I mean, uh, it gives immense amounts of power to the state. I mean, the state already has immense amounts of power. Yeah. But this is sort of centralizing that in a really, really major way. And yet, if you look at the sort of, uh, you know, waves of uh, any of these epidemics, they seem to be very, very localized. Yeah. So, yeah, I think the major problem is that, you know, it's been used now across the country. So at a time when it started in any pandemic, there are certain centers which have more intensity. But when you apply this law, you're locking down, you know, remote part of Arunachal Pradesh using the same law. You know, it clearly really doesn't uh, uh, make sense. Uh, so I think there's a good case to be made that this law needs a good look. Uh, the only thing, if you see the progression of this law since 1890, it's only become more stringent over time. You know, and in last year, they made an additional amendment so that because a lot of people were hitting doctors or something during the pandemic. So they had an additional fine of you know locking up people if they you know, uh, hit doctors, which is a good thing. But it just goes to show that nobody's really systematically thought of sitting down and you know overturning uh, uh, some of the key things. So I absolutely agree with you. Uh, a lot of power, uh, maybe too much power you know, given to the state. Though I would say that you know some power has to be given because what happens with the pandemic in particular is that it usually does not come every year, which means people kind of don't know how to behave. Uh, and there are a lot of people who will not, who, like in America we saw, you know, openly defy wearing masks and so on. And so there is a case to be made for some intervention to maintain overall public. Uh, so the debate is really how much of that. Because we saw last year what happened, you know, street vendors were harassed a lot of unnecessary harassment was done in the name of this particular So definitely some reform you know, uh, has to take place. So I'm, uh, there's a question from uh, uh, Professor Rupa Chanda. Uh, 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 
so I'm going to read it out. Uh, how do you see the pandemic affecting international migration in the medium and long term uh, from a structural transformation perspective uh, with the acceleration of digitalization? Uh, will it affect the relative demand of skilled versus unskilled labor? Uh, from an economic perspective, will it affect the demand for workers more generally? Will demographics matter less in international migration or will the uh, usual flows eventually uh, resume? Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, this is a, it's a big question uh, uh, for which she, she she knows the answer better than me. Uh, uh, the, I mean, obviously, I've been thinking a lot about migration and, and pandemics. Uh, uh, the the way I see, you know, what what will resume after this thing kind of you know goes out, maybe in a, a few years. Say, uh, the basic pressures for international migration were well known. That is, an aging society in Europe and and Northern America. Uh, and very soon, actually, even in the Gulf, which will uh, drive. So the demographics still favor the migration flows. Uh, what Professor Ruba is asking is, you know, really now with the added notion of digitalization, will it make it much more easier for people to, this idea, of, and I actually literally have friends who've left Delhi and are working in Goa, saying, you know, why to be in polluted Delhi and pay half the rent in Goa and live by the beach and so on. Uh, but my sense is it's going to be very short term. I, I do think that things will get back to kind of you know, what you're saying as the pre-COVID times uh, sooner. Uh, and I don't think it's going to be a major structural change in internet. And those pre-existing demographic differences uh, will still matter. I think what it will change is maybe some of the corridors. So that might be shifted. Uh, and even within India, some of the migrants, if you take this argument to internal migration, some of the migrants may not go to the same cities that they were thrown out of. They might try new cities. But the basic pressure in the source regions are there. Uh, that pressure is more from not work from home kind of jobs. Uh, and so they are, they are likely to explore new opportunities as and when they can. So broadly, my answer is, I, I think it will be more business as usual uh, than, than we think. Uh, uh, Professor Chanda has a follow-up question uh, in which he's looking at international uh, internal migration. So how do you think the pandemic will affect internal migration in the medium term once things normalize? Will it lead to a rethink on the part of the recipient states and also on the part of the migrant workers themselves? Yeah, no, that, that, that's, a, that's a very important question. And I think what, the, what on internal migration, what COVID has really done is for the first time brought internal migrants in the policy discourse in a big way, because everyone for the first time were forced to wake up and see that, you know, these people exist in our cities and so on. So for example, take this one nation, one ration card scheme. You know, this has been on the cards for a long time, but now there's more fo force for it. What I'll say is that on the one hand, there seems to be a lot of pro-internal migrant kind of uh, rhetoric, which is there at the central government level because of what happened last year, the migration crisis. But at the same time, you know, we are seeing unemployment, right? And we are seeing mass, I mean, very high levels of unemployment, again, COVID-induced. And unemployment is the classic kind of, you know, times of high unemployment is the classic times where you get nativist sentiment. And that is when you basically start again criticizing migrant workers for all of them. So we are seeing it today in Haryana. So Haryana just passed this 75% reservation law for locals, which is clearly, if you are, I just wrote an open piece on this, it's unconstitutional, it doesn't make sense, you know, et cetera, et cetera. But I do believe the impact of the pandemic is, is more in terms of increasing nativist rhetoric at the state government level. So on the one hand, we will say that your migrant workers should have access to the welfare state across India. But the states themselves, the state governments will start resisting this, especially the, the kind of uh, destination states. So states like Maharashtra, Gujarat, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, uh, Delhi, Haryana. And so, and so that's, I think, bound to increase. And so uh, unless the economy starts booming again, uh, this, there's only going to be more nativist uh, pressure. But again, I say the pressure to move is huge. And we are going to see massive you know, internal migration happening in the, in the coming decades. Uh, and we should not have such nativist laws. Uh, and we should focus on providing this architecture. Maybe like the GST council, we might want like an interstate migration council in which uh, these disputes are solved. Because there's a case to be made that if you do provide welfare services across, then maybe you're actually getting more. So Maharashtra, what, the Maharashtra government might say, why should we be paying for the Bihari migrant? Right? And so these kind of disputes might come about in the future. Uh, and there's no mechanism to solve these disputes uh, right now. So maybe we want like a GST council, something on the labor side. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, I just wanted to uh, pick on, uh, you know, you, you've been uh, referring to Lakshmi Bhai uh, in your book and her uh, Smriti Chitre, 
and i think this is a really fascinating sort of uh, diary of this lady who's sort of uh, been uh, put into this evacuation sort of uh, camp uh, she's uh, lost one child she's going to lose another child uh, and there is this entire thing of well i really don't know how to save my child uh, and so i sort of i'm going to do this very unscientific thing and then hope for the best and uh, because uh, you know the lack of reason uh, has sort of uh, so i mean it leads into her uh, saving her child on on completely unscientific uh, basis now uh, she of course comes back and sort of helps the community there uh, in in a very big way and i found that fascinating i mean i think even today if you look at covid and uh, many many neighborhoods people have actually tried to go out and help people in a very big way but it sounds like you know uh, in the same way that we are much more connected as a society even outside of um, you know uh, you know whatsapp facebook all of these things uh, make these things possible somehow uh, people seem to be getting a lot more false news uh, much larger rumors uh, and there's a large amount of scaremongering which one would have thought wouldn't really matter in today's day and age um i just wondering is it just too much supply of false news uh, yeah, lack of governance yeah. i don't know i mean so first thing is of course the uh, rumor i mean every pandemic has had you know massive amount of fake news rumors whatever yeah. you call it uh, the black death the the during the black death in europe the scapegoating was against the jews there were riots against jews they, they were jews were blamed for causing plague you know in the 14th century and in the age of pandemics i document you know various cases ambedkar in the 1940s is you know uh, pointing out to a woman in a, a village who has been burnt because she's uh, from a low caste and she's considered to have got cholera to that particular village uh, this one uh, there is uh, there was fake news that you know the the british were asking the plague persons to segregate into hospitals because they were extracting some fluids from the body and so on so all sorts of you know rumors uh, and and uh, a lot of you know outright fake on especially on vaccination you know on vaccination so much of fake news was there in the late 19th century on if you get vaccinated you get important you know variety of kind of things uh, today we have we'd say we have better reasoning but you know this technology is the technology was not there then right so fast a fast kind of uh, spread of uh, false rumors uh, across the board so that's how i see it right? uh, we have better you know reasoning you know based kind of a system hopefully uh, but on the same side uh, uh, the potential for a fake news to go you know completely uh, globally is is also there uh, uh, which is not there about 100 years back so this is always going to be there i think that's why maybe one of the things that any pandemic management should do is to really fact check or literally maybe even clamp down whatsapp and so on saying you know uh, uh, some of these basic things that are being forwarded has to go through like a basic fact check maybe some sort of a regulation of that might be warranted uh, during a for example last year you see the image of scapegoating of this uh, tablighi jamaat right, which which happened initially uh, it was par for the course in the pandemic you know earlier the british blamed the hindu pilgrims just like how these were muslim pilgrims the british blamed the hindu pilgrims from puri and all saying now oh, you guys you are you guys are the culprits if you guys did not go to these things you know <laughs> this is would not happen so a lot of scapegoating is is a very unfo- unfortunate reality of a uh, pandemic so if you ask me how do we stop this i really don't know i mean this is this is a classic no, no, I, mean, I, mean, I i i i'm just sort of speculating that i think the role of government is sort of very very different in mm-hmm. in times like this uh, and i mean speaking again to your sort of uh, epidemic laws so i mean some of those things some of those uh, roles are very very important but perhaps uh, they need to be titrated need to be sort of understood so technology perhaps common across the entire country but you know quarantine norms and yeah. you know, what's an essential good that should got to be something uh, locally determined rather than sort of nationally yeah. and and very good communication like i did on vaccination when it first started emerging in a mass way in ni- late 19th century yeah. uh, you know people were really aghast like you know these syringes are being inserted and so on but by 19 by 1920s you know uh, there was an acceptance public acceptance slowly entering saying that this is now fine this is okay and so this amazing kind of quip from the annual report of the hafkin institute which goes something like this where a riot would happen when uh, you know this the kind of sound of vaccination would be heard now a riot happens if the vaccine supplies run out Right. so this idea that you know, people have moved away from this idea of the vaccine to saying please give us the vaccine yeah. so that sort of a mindset shift has happened you know in, in the past yeah so uh chinmay um i would like to uh, sort of uh, thank you very much for uh, spending your afternoon with us uh, i think uh, this has been just wonderful i sort of uh, you know 
I'm going to use uh, your book for two reasons uh, in my sort of teaching. Uh, I'm going to use this. Uh, I already used the Jon Snow sort of thing for my econometrics thing, but I'm now going to use the, uh, you know, uh, the other, the image that you have yeah. of water from, you know, cast segregated. Yeah. I think it's just wonderful uh, to sort of motivate uh, uh, work in sort of a me methodology based sort of thing. Yeah. But I will also sort of uh, say that, I mean, this is also something that communicates to health policy, health economics kind of uh, conversations, because yeah. essentially uh, it is about how you park your scarce resources uh, when, you know, things change rapidly, dynamically. And so that that kind of uh, policy space is very very necessary, and I think yeah. uh, this book does a fantastic job of it. Um, uh, so uh, I think uh, I, I totally enjoyed the sort of uh, discussion that we've had, uh, and I think um, I look forward to sort of uh, hearing more uh, and sort of corresponding more with you. Uh, for anyone who's sort of uh, logged in, I'd like to point out that Chinmay's working paper is available online to everybody. And I'm sure he'd love to sort of hear from you on sort of, uh, you know, your thoughts on uh, various things there. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, and um, we are very glad that we could host you at the Center for Public Policy here at Time Bangalore. Thank you so much. Yeah, this has been uh, wonderful. Always a, a, a pleasure to come back to I'm Bangalore. Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank, thank you, Shinmay. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.